mechanical talk here. Yeah, I feel a little bit weird because I sort of do more or less the same talk each time, so I figure everybody must know this, but I guess when it comes down to it, it's usually worth repeating, and there's a lot of you who haven't been here before. So first of all, three things that you're going to want to do on a regular basis, even if nothing is specifically wrong, that you just want to do periodically to keep everything running best. One, and I mean most of you know this stuff, one is keep the tires inflated. You're going to want to pump those tires up at least once a month for the best performance. Now, how much should you pump up a tire to? You can take the lazy man's approach like I do and just pump the thing up to maximum because then it's the longest amount of time before you've got to pump the thing up. Now, there is a formula that somebody divined of, of what the optimum pressure is because, I mean, a rock-hard tire isn't necessarily the most efficient tire. Because if it's rock-hard, every time you hit a bump, it bumps you up. It lifts you and the whole trike up, and that lifting absorbs a certain amount of your energy. If the tire's a little bit soft, that it can act as a cushion, that it just kind of deforms the tire without lifting you up, that uses less energy. So you can actually, your optimum efficiency is not necessarily the highest pressure. How do you determine that? Well, what has been told, and again, I'm too lazy to do this myself, this is the sort of thing that people who want to optimize your performance do, is you measure the distance from the rim to the ground with the trike unloaded, and then with you sitting on it, what you should find is the distance should have compressed 15%. So the different, you know, so if it is, you know, if it's, well, I don't know, how, how should we say it? You know, if it's, if it's 20 millimeters tall, unloaded, well, 15, so it'd be 17 millimeters tall, loaded. I just picked out some numbers that would be easy to calculate on the fly there, but 15% is sort of a magic number for that if you're trying to optimize your tire pressure. Most of you, I know, aren't gonna do that, but some of you might. And if you're going on that long ride, and you know some long charity ride or something and you just want to make it as easy as possible think about that it probably requires an assistant to help out and some measuring tools but that's one thing i've learned about tire pressure the other second main thing that you're going to do on a regular basis is oil your chain when i when people come in and they just obviously have chains that have never been oiled i try to approach it very courteously and i ask so what do you use to oil your chain and, and the predictable answer is, I never oil my chain. It's like, oh, well, let me tell you, blah, 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 blah. Um, so once a month, oil your chain. If you get caught riding in the rain, you're going to need to oil your chain. If the bike has just sat around through a rainy season, even if it's been in the garage, it probably could use some oil just because it's had a lot of moisture around. So. Oiling the chain is a two-step process. One is you drip bicycle chain oil on it. You don't drip penetrating oil on it. It's long been said, don't use WD-40 on it, except now WD-40 has launched their own line of bicycle chain lube, so it makes it harder to give that easy advice. But you want to use stuff formulated for bicycle chain. Get with you in a second. And then the second part of the process is clean it off. If you leave the oil on the outside of the chain, it will just attract dirt. It'll allow the dirt to penetrate into the chain and it will increase the wear. You know, when chains wear out, they say stretch, but chains don't actually stretch. What actually happens is all the little pins wear down. That grit gets in there and as it turns, it wears that metal down. And so then what happens is the pins are all a little bit smaller. So in fact, parts can move a little bit apart and it looks like it's stretched. A question back there. Yes, before you do the steps you said, do you recommend degreasing? Depends on how finicky you are. You know, as I said, I'm kind of a lazy bicycle owner. I never bother with that. You're, you're better off keeping the chain oiled, and if the process of degreasing, cleaning, oiling the chain is too much for you to actually do and you don't oil the chain, well then you're not really ahead. So there's no benefit or, or I mean, there could be? Or? There's always benefits to cleaning things and that kind of stuff. You can get little chain cleaning devices that you kind of crank the chain through and it you know runs detergent through it and it runs it over a magnet to pull out any loose metal particles and you know i i could tell you that, that that's a good thing to do but i've never really done it myself i'm sure there are others of you who are very finicky about that and i'm not i'm not going to tell you to stop 
So yeah, any cleaning that you do is worthwhile. But of course, remember, once it's been cleaned, you've cleaned the lubricants out of it. It is all the more important to get the lubricants in there. And then the last regular maintenance thing to check, which is not, it's a recumbent specific thing, and it's not quite as well known, is check the tightness of your seat straps. Because this is, this is the, the beginning of your drivetrain right here, are the seat straps. Is the seat itself, and it takes a lot of force and they do work themselves loose, the seat's gonna become less comfortable as that gets looser. So, those are the three things. Keep the tires pumped up, keep your chain oiled, check the tightness of the seat straps. If you do that once a month, you're ahead of the game. So, any quick questions on that? Yes, sir. Uh, the stuff I sell. <laughs> um, Tri-Flow is kind of, you know, it's, it's sort of a blue-collar working man sort of oil, and it, it does the job. It's, it stays on reasonably long. Uh, rock and Roll Chain Lube is another one that we sell. It's more expensive, but it's slicker. And there are whack, there's, there's two kinds of lubes. There's synthetics, which is just what you'd think of as oil, and then there's the wax lubes, which are paraffin-based or something more fancy than paraffin based. I've used, at some time, I've, I use some stuff called uh, uh, Purple Extreme, which is actually built on Mother of Pearl. And it's, it's, it, they use that in the oil drilling industry, actually, to keep parts that are submerged underwater running well. And uh, I never actually carried Purple Extreme, but I, I, gave, I gave some to a couple from Galveston and said, try this out. So they put it on their trikes, and then they had a hurricane, and the trikes sat underwater for several days. And we never really got the chance to find out how well it worked on the chain because, well, the trikes were toast. So uh, my feeling with, with uh, the wax lubes is they don't last quite as long, though the fancy stuff like Purple Extreme, which required you to clean the chain completely before you put the stuff on, get everything out of it, that's... I'm sure that's great, but of course it's a whole bunch of trouble to get that on there. Uh, Bow Shield is another brand that we sell, and that is, it is reputedly a more a longer lasting wax oil. And I will admit that there are many products that I have that I am not as familiar with as I should be. The guy who's familiar with them is Micah, who. And you know, I don't really, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Mica when I get the chance, but it's great to have a sort of gadget guy who is so into this stuff. Because it's, it's a funny thing about me as a retailer, I'm only so much into stuff. I'm only so much into trying different things. There's some of you who like cruise by the shop every few weeks to see what's new and you know what they haven't bought yet. And they, they're always disappointed to find that it's more or less the same thing when I'm left up to it. Now that Mike is there, we're getting a lot more new stuff in, interesting stuff, some of which I brought, and I'll share with you if we got the time. But uh, okay, so I'm going to move on to the next part of this, which is identifying funny noises. If there's going to be a problem starting up, there's usually a funny noise associated with it. Things don't just suddenly fly into pieces unless it's the uh, unless it's the chain management system on an HP Velotechnic. Most <laughs> things, it, it, it kind of wears down, things get loose, things make noise. So there's three main systems, independent systems, that can be making noise. The wheels, the drivetrain, and the structure of the bike. The wheels and the drivetrain are in motion, and they move differently. So you can identify whether it's a problem in the wheel or a problem in the drivetrain by what you've got moving and how fast it's moving. If you hear the noise coasting downhill but not pedaling, it's the wheels. And if the drivetrain, the faster you pedal, you change gears, so you're pedaling faster or slower and that affects the noise, you know that the problem is coming from the drivetrain. Now the wheels, so there's a few parts and some of them can be kind of tricky. You know, obviously your wheel bearings can make noise. It's not the most common thing, the way they build these wheels nowadays, they don't really require continuous rebuilding and re-greasing, but it can happen. It's not very often that I actually deal with a problem in the hubs. In fact, one thing that's come up a few times in my career, and it's funny, you know, you know those quick release levers, and they got little conical springs on them, and sometimes if you install that spring backwards, so that the wide end is facing the hub, 
The way the wheel twists, I've seen that spring actually get dragged into the hub, and that conical spring finds itself in the bearings. It's, it's rather amazing that something like that, and then it screws up the bearings and the races and actually causes real damage to the hub. So you might check your quick releases to make sure that those springs are aligned correctly. I'm not even sure why they put those darn springs in there. They don't help that much, but... but so if you're getting a squeaking noise from the wheel, it could be the bearings, and it's easy enough to check that. But other things that I've seen make noises in the wheel are the reflectors. The reflector should be pushed all the way as far out as possible so that it's tight in the spokes. If it's further in, sometimes it can rattle around, and that'll make noise as the wheel spins. If you have Presta valves, or the Schwalbe Schrader valves with the, with the little nut that goes down the valve stem, that can rattle. So these are things that you don't normally think of. Usually these are things that we pick up on a new build and we take it out and ride it and there's some funny noise and you gotta check, oh yeah, the builder didn't push the reflector all the way down. Um, you know, tires, if a tire is wearing out, sometimes it bulges. And in fact, if a rim wears out, it can crack and start to bulge. I mean, if that goes too far, you're going to have a blowout and it can be a dangerous thing. But when as you hear the wheel spinning, every rotation, thump, thump, thump. I've had that happen on a tandem before, and I had ridden the thing to a nearby city to discover that the rim was falling apart. And, uh, you know, that, that made getting home kind of interesting. But, so if you're hearing, you know, if you're hearing a noise that's following the wheel, check those things and in particular if it's you know if a wheel is going out of true that can cause the same sort of problem if, if you've got a rim brake which you know most of you on trikes now don't even have rim brakes but a lot of the bikes do you can the rim can rub against the the brake sometimes it's just a small truing thing sometimes it's a very serious thing that the rim is cracking okay any questions about the wheels before i move on